So, uh, moving on, um, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Sylvester Gomez. He's the, uh, well, he's a paediatric emergency consultant at the Evelina in London. Um, he's a special interest in paediatric emergency consultant research, um, especially in the field of data and analytics and data services, sciences, sorry. Um, he's the lead for the paediatric emergency research network of UK and Ireland. And he's also an executive committee member and website manager for the Association of Paediatric Emergency Medicine. So I shall hand you over to Dr. Gomez. Um, thank you for that, uh, Simon. Um, my name is Sylvester Gomes. I'm one of the paediatric emergency consultants. Um, I wanted to share with you guys the journey which we've had with um, using the, the Horiba point of care machine. Now, um, to give a little background, I actually joined the trust in about 2019. And um, at that time, they already had the Hariba point of care machine in place. And um, within a few months of having come there, I was asked to take over the, the management of this, this machine. Now, there has been lots of um, very important, good advances with using the, using the point of care machine. And there, we also faced a few challenges, um, which was, and, and listening to um, the last speaker, we resonate in some of those areas. Next slide, please. So I thought I'd speak to you guys about the background, why we believe that in the pediatric emergency department, the point of care machine would be so useful. Um, and I wanted to um, show you three small exemplars, how this has been quite beneficial and talk a bit about the maintenance and the challenges which we face and if um, what, what solutions we may have for future and probably just um, ask others if what solutions they have also seen in their own trusts. Next slide. Now, as a, a pediatric emergency um, physician and even working in the emergency department, the kind of things, if you if you really start thinking, what are the kind of decisions which we make, which impacts on patient care, patient service, treatment management, we can actually dichotomize all our decision making into you know A and B, one or two. So you, you can have a child who comes to the emergency department, um, let's say um, walks in with a cough and cold, um, registers, gets seen by a triage nurse, then who um, picks up some vital signs. Uh, there's a bit of history. There's a bit of examination by the medical team. Following that, um, the kind of things we think about are actually very, very basic. Do I investigate or do I not investigate? Am I going to treat this patient or not treat this patient? Will this patient now require any subspecialty or specialty input like a pediatric surgery or plastic surgery, orthopedics, or do they need a referral as an outpatient clinic? Then the question is, are we going to observe a bit longer in the department or are we going to discharge this child home? Are we going to admit in the short stay area or uh, the inpatient? And following that, is there going to be any arranged outpatient reviews um, through a specialty team, a general pediatric team, or GP? Next slide, please. Um, this, I took a screenshot yesterday, and this is around 7 p.m. And as you can see, this is what an emergency department looks like. One of the critical things that we need to maintain in the emergency department is the flow. So as you can tell that nearly half the patients at that point have not even been triaged. And we have patients who are hitting a red under pediatric surgery, who probably needs to go to operating theater, their, their decisions to be done, their procedures to be done. And um, somewhere in between, we also have a child who is now at one or 14 minutes, who has a sepsis bomb, or a little high, high lot to say that this child is triggering on uh, observations or clinical parameters, which are actually off and needs um, immediate attention. So now um, from a pediatric emergency point of view, what do we need to do for these kind of patients? The flow is really, really important because we need to figure out which patient needs urgent care versus those who have minor injuries or minor illnesses. Next slide, please. So why point of care? Where does the point of care um, investigations become really, really important? Next slide. 
if one goes to Google um, pediatric sepsis or sepsis deaths in UK, you, you'll come up with pages and pages of um, babies and children who have actually succumbed to this condition. Now, sepsis is one of the severest uh, end of uh, as an outcome of an infection. It can begin with a cough and cold or runny nose, but then if there is in, indeed a serious bacterial infection, it can progress to death. Next slide, please. Um, I didn't want to go into great detail, but children behave slightly differently from adults um, in the sense that when they come into any, &E, they can be crying, they're fractious, they're, they're anxious, and all the observations can be totally skewed because uh, they are in a very different environment. And many children with a minor cough and cold, a runny nose or a tummy bug can actually be a child who's actually developing sepsis. And one of the things which actually makes us identify these highly at-risk children from amongst those who are quite well is a combination of clinical signs, which could be your observations, your vital signs, your um, um, general clinical examination, with some immediate laboratory um, findings. Next slide. For us in an emergency department, a delay in decision making and a delay in actually being able to diagnose what the problem is and what the what the treatment is required is actually a huge clinical risk. Next slide. And this is where the point of care machine becomes extremely useful for us because we can actually have results really, really quickly, which will allow us to start treatments, which means that patients can be routed to the right place to a short stay assessment unit, inpatient, or even discharge. Next slide. So what are we using? So when I joined in uh, 2019, um, next slide, we were using um, one of these machines, which is the, the, the micro semi uh, analyzer, which does the white cell count, neutrophils, CRP platelets, um, all within four minutes. Now, what is really, really important for us is that in, in a situation where we don't know what the diagnosis is, or we need a real quick answer, a combination of a full blood count, a CRP, a neutrophil, and a blood gas, which will include a lactate, which will include sugar and some electrolytes, gives us as much information as you can possibly have to make quick decisions, which will guide you into a management of, do I need intravenous fluids? Do I need to give intravenous antibiotics, admissions? And, um, or you can safely say that this child is actually doing quite well, we can discharge. Next slide, please. So I was going to share three scenarios, um, and hopefully I won't have to go into great detail. Um, this is, and we actually see so many different exemplars every day, but I thought I'll give three areas, uh, one in the surgical area, one is a, a child who's very, very small, and an older child who's slightly well. Next slide, please. So here we have Joshua, um, who is actually a three-year-old boy. Now, we see a lot of children with common coughs and colds every day. And for us, our biggest apprehensions are that are we safe to discharge them? So in this case, Joshua came in from a GP surgery and he's he they re recently moved into the city. He's joined a new nursery and has been having coughs and colds constantly. Now, about two weeks ago, um, he had a, a cold, he had a fever, he went to his GP and thought he had a throat infection and he was given antibiotics. He got better, but now again, over the last five days, he's been having fever again. He has a bit of vomit, slightly loose stools. He's got rash on his body. And this time his nap nappy is a bit dry. So he comes into triage. He's got a high temperature, but all his observations are within normal limits. Now the doctor comes in, has a look and finds no focus for um, this high temperature. His ears, nose and throat, which is commonly a quite red in children with um, upper respiratory tract infection is normal. His abdomen, his chest, everything is normal. What do we do? So you've got a child who's got now five days of fever who's already had a course of antibiotics. So as we do in, in, in an emergency department, we start a fluid challenge where we give steps of fluids to a child. We decide to do uh, repeat observations and check urine to be absolutely sure there's no urine infection. And we do a point of care. Next slide. So then we get this result where the CRP is 3.5, white cell count is normal, neutrophils are normal. 
So this makes us far more reassured that this is probably a repetition of another viral infections. It is quite common for children in nurseries or those who have siblings who go to nurseries or school to pick up multiple virus infections. What it has allowed us to differentiate is that this is not a serious bacterial infection, um, which we which we be very uh, apprehensive about sending home. So the plan was made, um, right? This is virus, virus infection. We've given them some resources um, to look up, um, given some safety ad advice and send them home to be followed by the GP. Next slide. So in the case of most smaller children, for us pediatricians and um, physicians in hospital, even general practice, we are extremely, extremely careful for children um, under three months, and especially those who are around one month to two months. So in this case, Holly is a six-week uh, infant um, who presents to our emergency department because the mom felt that she was quite warm to touch. Now, fever in a small child this age, we are extremely cautious that this is not sepsis or a serious infection harboring somewhere in the body. So this baby was not feeling as well as normal. Um, it comes and has a sibling at home who has a cough and cold and a fever, which has got better. The mum couldn't get hold of a GP and called NHS 111, who said, go to hospital and get it seen by a doctor. In this, in the, in this circumstance, this is a real child who came in a few days ago, has no temperature and all observations are normal. The only thing we find is child, when he examined, it's not exactly behaving as he normally would, a little more quiet, a little more fractious at other times. So the question is, do you actually go full out and say this is a sepsis or a serious infection, go with all guns firing, give intravenous antibiotics, or do you wait and watch, say this could be a virus infection that the baby has picked up from the sibling? So at that point, we're thinking, okay, let's wait and watch. We can admit for observation at short stay unit, do repeat um, observation to see what the trends are, and let's do a basic screen of blood tests, which is a blood gas, a glucose, a lactate, some electrolytes in the blood gas, and a point of care, and definitely, definitely check for urine. Next slide. Now, urine, getting a urine sample in this age group is a total challenge. Um, babies don't pee on demand, and you'll be stuck with a parent holding a little pot um, uh, around the nappy, waiting for urine samples to come at some point when they bless us. So in this situation, within a few minutes, we had a CRP of 58, raised white cell count in neutrophils. Straight away, we know there is something not quite right. This is a serious bacterial infection somewhere, except we have not figured out. So this allowed us to make an immediate decision, right, we are going to start intravenous antibiotics immediately. We're going to do a full septic screen, which means we're going to do a chest X-ray, we're going to do a lumbar puncture, which is fluids from the spinal area. And, and during that time, because the baby has not passed urine, we put a small catheter and we took a urine sample, and lo and behold, that's where the bacteria was. So we knew straight away this was urosepsis uh, within minutes of the child being assessed and having the point of care done. Next slide. This is boy um, Khalid. He is seven years old. And this is the third one, how a point of care can be useful in acute surgical problems or actually being able to differentiate it is not. So this boy was sent home from school because he had the belly pain. Then during the night, he was crying and he was whinging, woke up his parents, he got some paracetamol, felt much better in the morning. However, he continued to have some uh, abdominal pain and said, oh, it's on my right side. Then the, the mom then has a, a virtual appointment with the GP. He said, right, this could be appendicitis, go straight to hospital. So he comes to hospital, um, his observations are normal. He does say that he's got pain um, in his tummy, but he's um, sitting on mom's um, lap and he's playing with his mobile phone. So during the examination, we couldn't find anything really specific. He's got pain all around the abdomen a little bit in the right eyelid fossa, which is where the appendix sits. He's got a bit of loaded colon, which seems to allude, yes, this could be a, a bit of constipation. So what do we do next? Is it appendicitis? Do we ring the surgeons, get him admitted? Or do we treat for constipation? So we decided to wait and watch. Uh, we got a play specialist in, got him some toys, gave him some painkillers, and decided to check his urine and did a point of care test. At that point, we said, let's wait. To, um, let's not speak to the surgeons as yet. Next slide. 
And then we come back with a CRP of one, white cell counts are completely normal. So by that time, uh, uh, um, we did a, a repeat set of observations, maybe an hour or two had gone by, the pain had settled, and we realized, right, based on those inflammatory markers, that his pain has settled, he has got no fever, vomiting, this is unlikely to be appendicitis. And we're able to discharge this patient home safely with follow-up with the GP and uh, with the treatment of laxatives. Next slide. So then comes the next question, right? So there is huge benefits of using the point of care um, testing in the emergency department. This is the way into the future as technology is developed. We have so many other point of care um, um, microbiology tests, um, which is differentiating between viruses and bacteria, which are being developed right now. But it comes with a few challenges in an emergency department. Next slide. So when, when we first developed and um, engaged with point of care, um, at that point, um, we hadn't set up the right infrastructure. So at this point of time, um, myself and a few other colleagues, we are responsible for the education and training of all the junior doctors. Now, this is almost like working with, um, we are trying to tune a car with the engine running. So every few months, come March, come, um, come September, we have a new bunch of doctors joining. So we have to go through the education and training competencies every few months. And unlike most other units, emergency departments, you cannot get all the doctors at one go. Um, and it is quite challenging to get this, this part of testing done. Now, we don't have a contract with our point of care team to, sorry, to, to do the uh, point of care, the, the quality controls every day. As per, as per our governance, we have to do a low level and a high level uh, quality control every day. And on a Monday, we run three levels, high, mid and low, and a deep cleaning. So this is left to us doctors to um, manage on a daily basis. And it's, especially when you begin your shift and the department's really, really busy, it is quite challenging because doctors, they would have taken the point of care um, uh, the QCs out, they were forgotten and gets dinner chord, or they've done half half done, or they were they were completely ignored the fact that there was a small indicator, there was a red flag, and the training goes it goes in cycles over and over again. Um, so at this point, as a result of um, the COVID pandemic, we've just had some medical um, assistants who are working with COVID packs, we call Kefid. And we are currently training them to use our point of care machines from April. So they would be able to do the quality controls and the testing for us during the day between eight o'clock and nine o'clock. However, this funding is quite temporary and um, I'll be quite intrigued to know how else everybody else is managing. Next slide. Um, sorry, uh, um, I hope I've been able to do justice to our point of care machine because we absolutely feel this has got amazing value um, and most days when it's running it's 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 amazing to use um, and have results and make decisions really, really quickly um, we're still coping with the challenges i'll be quite happy to know what how others are using it in, a, in an emergency setting thank you thank you dr omis um <clears throat> there's one question that's come up in the chat uh, which I think you may have answered, but um, what impact has the instrument had to your department in relation to COVID? Um, but I think you sort of mentioned that COVID has meant you've had some additional funding. Is that, that correct? Yeah, um, I think there are, two, there are two parts of it. Very, very interestingly, during the main pandemic, which is around 2020, we actually saw a huge decline in pediatric patients coming to the emergency department. So uh, during that time, we didn't have so much QCs to be done and so many tests to be done. Now, as the pandemic has uh, kind of subsiding, I won't say subsiding, but schools and life is reopening, nurseries have started opening, schools have started reopening. So we're having a huge influx of patients, not with COVID, but um, fever and fever illness, illnesses, which are quite undifferentiated. So usage has gone up hugely over the last few months. 
Now, as a result of the pandemic, we had some funding, but again, this is going to be quite temporary. And we anticipate that by the time it's September, the funding will be pulled. So we don't have a second option as yet. We are still negotiating with our point of care team to get this done. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's another question from Alistair. Uh, do you feel that point of care testing in ED has led to an increase in unnecessary testing? Um, that's an interesting thought, and I'll, and I'll be honest. Perhaps on some occasions we may have done, if we didn't have that facility at all, we may have gone by clinical decision making. But the difference is this, the really sick children, there's absolutely no contention are going to need blood tests. The undifferentiated fever are, are the ones where um, the, big, the, the big point about are they safe enough to go home or not. And here in these contexts, yes, we may be doing slightly more tests because they're handy, they're quick at hand, but we make safe decisions to be discharged from the hospital. Right. Um, <clears throat> uh, another question is, uh, does your department have any pressure from the trust to have tests accredited? And that's a question from uh, Ryan. By accreditation, do you mean validation? Uh, I think that's what they're meaning. Um, you, um, you have no... accredited to ISO, don't we? we have a governance structure right now. So before the, 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 the point of care machine was installed, it ran its validation checks um, in, um, in conjunction with lab tests um, before it was actually used in the emergency department. And right now, we have every month um, an EQA equivalence testing of the point of care um, machine versus being run with the lab. And they run reports every month to say, how is the CRP performing? How is the white cell neutrophils platelets performing? And based on that, we sometimes have to liaise back with the technical team to, um, uh, to make adjustments to the quality, to the calibration. And it's it's an ongoing process, and most of the um, times we've had extremely good results, where it's a, it's in the good range. Um, and does that answer the question, or? I think one of the other questions was about UCAS, but um, I know that you do um, UCAS accreditation, but that's via the lab, I would assume. That's um, correct. Yeah. So someone from the from the lab actually comes and um, um, takes blinded samples and runs it in the point of care machine and an equivalence in the lab and then checks results to see how, how much concordance there is and runs percentages on that. Okay. Uh, there's another question from Tarek. Uh, as a parent, being frustrating. Um, after quick observation from the doctor that it's a viral infection, uh, do parents feel more reassured of the diagnosis because of the testing done? Absolutely. Um, well, because it, there are two parts of it. So when we sometimes tell parents, look, um, this is virus infection, this is going to get better. There are no um, clinical signs to say it's a ear infection, throat infection. However, along with that, when we're able to support that hypothesis along with a blood test, which is really quick to say, look, this is an inflammatory marker test, this is a CRP, this is a white cell count, and these fall within the normal range and seems to support that it's a virus infection, parents feel more reassured and they feel more confident that they can now approach the GP or even try home or self-care rather than come back to the hospital again. Okay, thank you. Uh, a couple more questions. Uh, there's one from Tony. Um, have there been any measures of the improvements made, i.e. length of stay in the emergency department or time to discharge figures? Oh, absolutely. So historically, um, when we had children coming to the emergency department, um, um, one of the as we teach all our junior doctors and nurses one of the one of the best investigations is observation so when children come into the emergency department and they have fever or they have minor illnesses 
and where the diagnosis or the um, uh, impression is not completely certain, one of the things we always had to do was do rep repeat observations, and that maps out the trajectory of how well or unwell the child is. Now, in these situations, um, when we are able to do a, a quick a point of care test along with a blood gas and the results come back as normal, it can cut short the length of stay in the department because then we know that point A, these are the observations, point B, these are the observations in conjunction with the blood test. They all support this minor illness or virus infection and children can be safe to be discharged. It does have, it has really helped a lot. The other thing is um, when we send a blood test to the laboratory, there is a whole process we have to uh, print off labels, it goes packaged, it goes to another unit, uh, um, to the area next to us, it goes to a pod, it goes to the lab. So that process can take a minimum of 20 minutes to half an hour. Whereas a point of care will actually expedite that by doing it within four minutes of um, processing time and maybe 10 minutes stops between taking the sample and getting the result. So yes, it does help a lot. Okay. <clears throat> There was a question from Marion um, from Portsmouth, which I think was along a similar line. Um, it was asking, what is your laboratory turnaround time? Because in Portsmouth, the lab actually advocates the reduction of the turnaround time to acceptable levels, as opposed to introducing point of care testing. But I think you've sort of answered that, I think. Um, um, I think we've got, sorry. No, uh, so I think one. there are some other questions that, again, we will address uh, to the speakers and get them to the to everybody once we've finished. I think we've probably got time for just one more question. Um, so there's a question, what approach do you take to decide what test at point of care and what goes to the lab? Yeah, so yeah, that's a very, very important question. Um, there are two, when I have a patient, for example, who comes in, um, and because the kind of examples I would get, it may be endless, and it, we tailor that to a clinical situation. So if I have a patient who comes in, let's say with swollen glands, and it's got fever, and or is un feeling unwell, and my, my main focus at that point is to see what is the differential count, or what are, um, are they, am I going to look at blasts or which means I'm thinking of malignancy or um, if that's the general direction, I would send that to the lab. We also have, um, a, we have tertiary levels of sickle cell disease. So if you have children with sickle cell um, with painful crisis or fever or infection where we need to look at a whole range of other parameters like reticular cell counts, I would send that to the lab. Or there are other group of children where they have had fever for way too long and fits into Kawasaki's disease or PIMS TS, where we need not just the full blood count, but things like D-dimers or troponins. I would not waste time having one part of the result. I would do the whole panel um, to the lab. And if we see really abnormal skewed results in the point of care, we would check that by sending to the lab too. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh... I think, yeah, thank you, Dr. Gomez, for that. That's yeah, uh, very interesting. So um, I think we will now move on to our next speaker.